what I would now propose to do is move straight to our first panel, which I think picks up many of these themes that we've already heard, uh, because we're going to focus on policy and political dimensions of Euro-Mediterranean migration and mobility. I'm very pleased we've got three excellent uh, speakers who will speak for around 10 minutes, so again we'll have time for questions and discussion. So I'll briefly introduce them uh, in the order in which they speak. We will hear first from uh, Natalie Tocci, who is the director here at the Istituto uh, Affari Internazionali. Then from the Honorable Lia Quattapelle, who is a member of the Chamber of Deputies of the Italian Parliament, mem a member of the Committee on Foreign and European Community Affairs. And, uh, and thirdly from uh, Tatiana Esposito, who is Director General for Immigration and Integration Policies at the Italian Ministry of Labour and Social Policies. So we've got a, a, an excellent panel, and without any further ado, I'll hand over to uh, Natalie. Great. Thanks, Andrew. Um, and what I'll do is I'll start making a couple of remarks on the politics and then uh, a few on, on the policy. Uh, but really starting off from uh, the premise uh, that I think you outlined right at the beginning, which is how to have a discussion which goes beyond uh, the, the current crisis or what we consider to be uh, the current crisis. Uh, and I really wanted to also reconnect to many of the things that, uh, that Franco was, uh, was saying. I think at the moment we're in this slightly odd situation in which we're having a sort of disconnected in many respects uh, sort of slightly schizophrenic debate. Uh, and it's a debate which really is, uh, rather than a debate, a sort of monologue of, uh, you know, two monologues of the deaf. Now, monologue number one, uh, which is the dominant uh, monologue. Uh, so this is the monologue that indeed talks about the crisis, uh, presents the crisis as a security crisis, um, and the kind of things that uh, you hear in this debate, which is, which is the dominant debate, uh, are issues uh, such as you know, the need, well, at the heart of it is the need to stop the flow. Uh, whether that flow is refugees, whether that flow is migrants, but the need to stop the flow. And then you articulate this debate in different shapes and forms, and hence you talk about uh, uh, repatriation and, and readmission. Uh, you talk about uh, the need uh, for an externalization of migration policy, and in particular using transit countries as, if you like, the cork hmm, uh, in order to stop that flow. Uh, you talk about uh, the nexus between security and migration, uh, as opposed to development and migration, which is what Franco was referring to, uh, and, there, and therefore highlighting the dangers uh, involved in this flow, and hence justifying why there is a need uh, to stop the flow. You talk about uh, the imperative of, of border control, um, so, I mean, the, the, I mean, and I'm not arguing here that these are wrong points to talk about. Huh? They're all perfectly legitimate issues to discuss. But this is basically the be-all and end-all of, uh, uh, of that debate. When you do talk about issues, more internal issues, uh, such as, for instance, relocation, uh, you talk about it in terms of uh, more than, if you like, the, the sharing of, of responsibility and solidarity. It is really a, and, and the term used, and, and we tend to use it as well, is burden. Mm? So this is a problem. Mm? This is a problem, uh, and therefore, because it's a problem, it should be uh, shared equally uh, amongst, amongst different players and therefore uh, amongst different member states. Then you have a completely different debate, uh, another monologue. Uh, let's say it's the uh, sort of um, it's the monologue of, of many human rights organisations. Um, it, it's, it's the monologue of also some minority political actors, and it's basically a monologue that highlights two different aspects. Uh, the first is is the human rights uh, imperative, uh, and therefore it's it's a normative argument, the need to take because it's right to do so. It's right, legally speaking, it's right, uh, uh, sort of morally speaking, uh, and therefore it has to be done. The second argument is more economic and utilitarian. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to take the flow because it's good for us economically. We need, we need the migrants. We need the migrants for our economy. And again, I'm not arguing that there is necessarily something wrong in these debates. My point really here is that these are two monologues that actually are not interacting with one another. This is really a dialogue uh, of the deaf. Um, 
so how is it and, and, and what is it that we should be doing and we should have the courage to, to do from a political perspective in order to actually reconnect uh, many, uh, many of these discussions. Uh, and, and here I think is really where also the conversation of labor migration comes into play, but I'll come to this towards, towards the end. I think it's right to recognize, uh, and this is in a sense a message to the second monologue, uh, it's important to recognize that indeed there is a problem with irregularity. Uh, because indeed irregularity does pose or potentially poses a security risk, simply for the very basic fact that you don't know who it is that is coming in uh, and therefore potentially and not only potentially there can be a, a, a security uh, problem. Um, yes, it is true uh, that border controls are important. Uh, it is true that in the whole first phase of the construction of Schengen, because we were living in a different era, we were so preoccupied with the inside that we completely forgot uh, about, about the outside. Again, it was it, it framed in a particular political context. That political context is, has changed, and I think it's important to recognize that, indeed, there is work to be done when it comes to, uh, to, to border control. It is also true, uh, and this is in a sense a response to, if you like, the dominant first monologue, uh, that actually Europe, qua Europe, can absorb the kind of flows we're talking about. Um, we are talking about a union of 500 million. Uh, even if, and we will not get uh, to the numbers that we had, uh, I'm thinking about 2015, but even if we are to get to those kind of numbers, one million out of 500 million really is not that much. Mm. So there is really a question of how, how do you uh, manage that million? Where do they go? How do you integrate them? Uh, how, do you, how do you host them, which is the discussion, rather than a, a broad question of absorption uh, of, uh, of those numbers. A point that I always make when talking about the so-called uh, refugee crisis or migration crisis is this is not a crisis of numbers. Let's be very frank about it and open about it. Uh, we can talk about it in terms of a crisis uh, of values. We can talk about it in terms of a crisis of solidarity. It is not a crisis of numbers. <laughs> It is almost insulting to talk about it as a crisis of numbers when we go and talk to the you know, Lebanese or, uh, uh, or Jordanians or, or even Turks uh, and, and tell them that we have a problem of, uh, of numbers. Um, so you know, there, there, are, there are elements of, uh, of truth in all of these uh, debates, but I think at the bottom, uh, the, the bottom line of all this, and this is really where I come to the point of, of, of labor migration is we need to have the courage politically to say and to admit that this is a flow that will not be stopped. This is a flow that has to perhaps reduce. It is a flow that certainly has to be regulated. But if you want to reduce it and regulate it, you have to start talking openly about the fact that you're not going to be stopping it. You're not going to be stopping it because you can't. You're not going to be stopping it because you shouldn't. Huh? Uh, but, but even just sticking with the can't, it is something that politically at times it's very difficult to admit. Uh, but the problem that we end up having by not admitting it openly is that we're essentially playing the same game uh, as, as, if you like, the so-called populists. Huh? Um, we're just not playing it as well, and therefore we're bound to lose as a result of it. <laughs> Um, and, and so this is really where I, I, I come to the point of labor migration, and this is really where I'll, uh, I'll conclude. Not only is it impossible to stop the flow, not only is it impossible to reinsert the cork, uh, and therefore it is all very well and good to have a focus on transit countries, but if this is the only focus, and this is in a sense the criticism that I would make to the current policy of, of the Italian government, which tends to be very focused exclusively on Libya, because I think, and although they're not admitting it, but at the back of their minds is the illusion that you can recreate the conditions prior to 2011. That is an era which is gone. And therefore, I embrace, and I think the work that, for instance, Leah has been doing in Parliament has been extremely important uh, in, in, in embracing more the, the, uh, a, a more rounded approach towards Africa. Uh, and therefore, a far more, and this is the point that President Fertini was also making, uh, a, a far more um, sort of political uh, uh, approach uh, towards countries of origin. Now, what does this approach consist of? Um, I completely agree that money, yes, it's part of the discussion, but it is not the only component. 
Uh, it is a rather marginal component, I would say. Not because they will not take the money. Of course they'll take the money. Uh, the point is, they'll take him the money and that's it. Uh, you know, the point that you were making about your times uh, with, uh, with Louis Michel in the, in the commission really struck me uh, about how much money is being wasted. And I connect this to a piece of data that I came across last year, which was basically a survey amongst... Um, you know, sort of uh, non-European countries uh, about how they perceive the European Union and what, which area do they see the European Union as being most and least active. Now, we all know how much money the EU gives in aid, in development assistance. This was the area of development assistance in which the European Union is least visible, in which the impact is considered to be the lowest. Lower than diplomacy, we all know that I mean, you know, this has been part of the debate. You know, is there a European foreign policy? Ooh, well, if there is, that is really quite marginal in many respects. Uh, less visible than on security and, 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 uh, and defense. Yeah, I mean, now we're making, you know, some efforts, but, you know, we've got a very long way to go. You know, development has really been the core of what, uh, of the way in which the EU has done foreign policy, and yet it is the least visible. So again, it is an important component, but really not the only component. The point is we have to construct a bargain which is much, much broader, and a bargain with particularly countries in sub-Saharan Africa. What are the elements of, those, uh, of, of that bargain? As I said, uh, aid is one part, of course. Trade, but not the trade that we're interested in, the trade that they're interested in. Otherwise, uh, it's, it's not going to do the trick. Uh, and a third component, most important, uh, and the one in which we're having most difficulty in actually having an honest debate is labor migration. Uh, again, if you, want to, uh, if you want to manage this issue, it is not a question of stopping the flow, it's a question of regulating it, and therefore at the heart of it, the whole challenge is that of transforming a flow which is irregular into a flow which is regular. And the only way to do it is to pick up many of the files that, Franco, you were working on a decade ago, which have been dropped precisely because we have entered into crisis mode. Uh, now, we're not uh, going to exit that mode anytime soon, but I think it's our responsibility uh, to actually bring out the debate uh, publicly and publicly say, as I said, it is not a question of stopping, it is a question of regulating, and labor migration is part of that trick. Thank you, thank you, Natalie. That was uh, a very powerful overview of the issues, and I would like to hand over now to the Quattapelli. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm generally very happy about discussing issues on migration and the Mediterranean because we haven't yet found uh, an answer to many of the problems that we're facing. So I think more discussion should help us focus better. But I think the discussion of today comes uh, at a very interesting point of the debate on migration in Italy. Uh, we have um, assisted to the fact that uh, in the last uh, few weeks there had, uh, a debate developed on the role of NGOs in the Mediterranean Sea. And uh, for the first time, uh, the Italian general public has become aware of the fact that NGOs exist, that uh, NGOs operate in the Mediterranean. Of course, I mean, we have 200 NGOs in, in Italy, four of them are in the Mediterranean. So the picture that uh, the general public is getting is slightly blurred. Um, still, I think that uh, that debate, as Natalie was saying, is a debate that is truly misleading, not only for the content of it, but especially because it is focusing the debate of 2017 on migration policy on a very small part of what migration challenge is to us, which is journeys, which is a search and rescue operation, which is what happens in the Mediterranean. And of course, it's, I think, uh, heartbreaking for all of us to think that uh, so many people are dying in the Mediterranean every day. Uh, this doesn't happen in any other conflict area but Syria in the world. Sometimes the news of wreckages have numbers of victims that are higher per day of what happens in Syria. So it is a crisis, but that's not the problem. We have to be <laughs> honest to ourselves. I mean, the policy problem sits elsewhere and it sits in the countries of origin and countries of transit and in what people find when they arrive in Europe. And we have to be clear 
on this and we should really steer the debate to go in that direction rather than focusing on what Save the Children, MSF, uh, Sea Watch, whatever, are doing in the Mediterranean. Because otherwise we, we completely miss at least the, the, the political point of it. So I, should, I want to, to give two points on this uh, related to the, to the issue of labor migration. Being in the crisis mode, we tend to forget that labor, in my opinion, is the central point in the migration uh, issue right now. It is the central point because in the, the root causes of migration, uh, lack of employment, poverty, are two of the most important factors that, at least for the African route, but not, not only for the African route, to an extent also for the Syrian refugees, are really driving uh, fluxes towards Europe. I mean, Syrian people stayed at the border with Syria for uh, quite a long time, waiting to be back to go uh, back to, to, to Syria. When they finished savings, when they saw that uh, um, the war was not ending, when they saw that the countries uh, that were hosting them were not willing to let them work for different and complex reasons, they came to Europe. So really, labor is at the core, in my opinion, also um, of the problem with Syrian refugees. So um, if we focus on too much on journeys and how people travel, we tend to forget the root causes. And one thing, one point that I would like to make is if poverty, lack of employment are two of the core reasons why people leave their country of origin, we should really try to understand how aid is impacting in those aspects. We had a long way of uh, development aid and development cooperation practices focusing in uh, service creation, health, education, human rights, which is all fine. We really have little impact, little evidence of the impact or little focus on the impact and the effectiveness of aid on employment creation and, uh, and labor markets. And really, we should, uh, I when we uh, increase resources uh, to aid, especially in Italy, we worked a lot on Africa, we should focus on this. That's the first point. Second point concerns uh, Geneva Convention. We always say, we often say, Geneva Convention needs to be rev revisited because the uh, <laughs> migrants that arrive in Europe uh, are kind of refugees, but often they're not refugees as such as uh, prescribed by G Geneva Convention. I think r rather than reviewing the Geneva Convention, we should really focus on what, what was said before, which is starting to work seriously on legal ways of entering in Europe. We always say this, the Commission said this two years ago, but no European government is ready to work on this aspect. There is no, no political appetite, but that would be a major way to help us uh, tackling the problem of uh, migration, at least in a rational way. So there are refugees, and we should take all the refugees, and there are people that come here to work, and we should have them have legal ways. Maybe migra migration flows cannot be stopped, but at least they can be strongly reduced. And thinking about and working politically seriously on this aspect is the better, the true better way to stop uh, migration flow. It's not a problem of NGOs. It's not a problem of who, of who is at, uh, at sea in the Mediterranean. It is really uh, how we provide legal ways for people to come in a safe manner to Europe. Uh, that's the, se the second point. I should also mention the fact that uh, many um, organizations working with migrants, at least in Italy, report that 15 to 20 percent of them seek psychiatric help when they are in Italy, 15 to 20 percent of them. Some of them, of course, come from pre-existing com different conditions, but many of the people working with them in Italy report 
that the conditions of the journey really make more fragile people that come from an already fragile background. So working on legal ways of migrating not only reduces, of course, uh, the power that smugglers have, not only reduce the fact that uh, journeys are not safe, but really help us <coughs> preventing problems that then we have to deal with when people arrive in Europe. 15 to 20 percent uh, of people that uh, seek psychiatric help means that probably more than 15 to 20 percent need psychiatric help and really means that the job of integrating these people into society is m more costly and probably less successful. So we will have people with uh, true problems and I'm saying this thinking about examples that come, come from newspapers like uh, Kabobo case of uh, somebody that came uh, psychologically damaged and then killed um, by passers in Milan two years ago using a knife. And we see more of these instances coming uh, also in Germany and also in other European countries. Third point, what uh, migrants find when they are here, at least in Italy? They find a very good system of search and rescue at sea, a very good system that tries to save lives, a kind of good system of first welcoming, so depending uh, of the uh, region when they where they arrive, depending on, but really our uh, Home Affairs Ministry is working seriously on this PRAR system, which is a system that is spread throughout the country, divided in small centers. Yesterday, a big protocol was signed in the city of Milan with 76 mayors, uh, suggesting them that they should take three people, every thousand inhabitants in their city. So really, the, the Ministry of Home Affairs is working well in this respect. But at least in Italy, there is no provision whatsoever on the issue of jobs no provision whatsoever, while we know that integration is done mainly through schools and jobs. And I say this because the only country that really started thinking strategically about this issue is Germany. Germany uh, made an addendum to the, to the coalition pact uh, when the big uh, crisis from the Balkan route started, they made an addendum, they said we need an integration law. Integration law that requires language courses, civic orientation courses and job orientation. The integration law in Germany costed to Germany for two years 25 billion euros. Last year Italy passed a budget law for the entire economic policy of our country that was 25 billion euros, 27 billion euros. So it is clear that at least for Italy, for Greece, for other countries, if you want to tackle strategically the problem of integration through job creation, we need to keep together the issues of fiscal space on the one hand and on the other hand integration. And so we need to be proactive at the European level to suggest not only the flexible solidarity that Franco Frattini was speaking about, but also this issue of fiscal space to accommodate new migrants coming. It is true, as Natalie was saying, that if we look at the numbers, Italy has been able to integrate and to accommodate for, let's say, foreigners coming into our country in the past. In 2008, 403,000 people came and were able to integrate themselves in the job market in Italy. It was 2008. The crisis hadn't hit yet. And it is, I think, clear to most of us that those numbers were sustainable in a different job market. If you look at the data coming from um, uh, the, the, this year report from Fondazione Ismo, they say that uh, uh, Fondazione Ismo, which is a very reputable source in Italy on, uh, on migration, they say that, of course, there is a job market that is recovering after the crisis, but the job market is recovering especially for Italians. Migrants still have a lower percentage of people that managed to find a new job after the crisis. So we should keep this data in mind, the 25 billion euros 
uh, that, were, that are spent, are being spent in Germany for integration, the fact that you need to focus on those people that are more fragile to enter the labor market, and sometimes, not always, but sometimes, they are people that don't speak well Italian, are not scholarized enough, and often these are people that are not Italian by nationality, let's say, and we should focus on this, because otherwise we keep a political debate on the journeys, thinking that we can solve the problem there, but the problem is not there. It is in the country of origin and the country of transit, and it is in Europe, in Italy, when they come here, what do we do to make with them a different society as Italy is becoming? Thank you very much. Uh, th many thanks for those very important observations, and uh, I'd like now to invite Tatiana Esposito to contribute. Thank you very much for inviting me, and um, I, I plan to, to intervene sharing with you some of our numbers. Uh, I was planning to intervene in this sense, but so many things have been said in this first part of the debate that I will probably uh, reduce my intervention on the numbers and react to some of the um, solicitations uh, of the previous debate. Why numbers? Um, one of the questions uh, in your uh, background paper uh, related to the how how do we can we change the perception on migration? Uh, this is very difficult to do. Uh, the two monologues that Natalie was referring to before, uh, and especially the dominant monologue, uh, very often ignore numbers, and even if. Uh, numbers are known, are not used in the public debate. And uh, the public debate on migration only uh, refers to the 180,000 uh, uh, migrants arrived to Italy last year. But besides this 180,000, there are 5 million non-EU nationals living, legally residing in our country and perfectly integrated and contributing to our economy and to uh, uh, the sustainability also of our pension system, for example. Uh, there are more or less 800,000 kids, youngsters, in schools with our kids. Uh, friends of our kids, playing with our kids. But these numbers are never mentioned in the public debate. This is why, as a public administration, as an institution, we consider extremely important to invest in knowledge, to have affordable numbers publicly uh, disposable numbers, and as a ministry, we invest a lot on this issue, for example, by producing every year a report on the labor market of migrants in Italy, by producing each year community reports, uh, focusing on the 15 main communities present in Italy. Even because if we want to design effective policies in terms of integration, we cannot consider migrants as a whole. We have to uh, be available to have actionable knowledge to guide the design of the policies. And if you look into the communities, you discover a lot of interesting things on the countries of the area for example, uh, I just focused on three of them because of the, their importance in terms of numbers. Because most of the countries of the area are below 1% of presence. Uh, the only three above 1% and in some cases well above are Egypt, Morocco and Tunisia. 
And if you look into the community, you discover, for example, some specificities. And you discover that maybe, uh, in case of Egypt or uh, Morocco, you have to plan specific gender-based policies if you want to integrate the community. This is less the case for, Tunisia, for Morocco. Morocco is the community with the longer migra migratory history among the three, and this is reflected also in the uh, kind of permits they own. Almost 70% of permits are non-renewable, uh, not uh, long-term uh, residence permits. Uh, you discover in which sectors they work, in which regions they live, so you can uh, address policies to specific sectors or specific areas of the country. And you discover, for example, that in the case of Egypt, uh, we have a problem with minors, with unaccompanied minors. And this is a specific issue, very sensitive issue, and we should all together try to figure out how to deal with this problem. Because uh, Egyptian unaccompanied minors are the highest uh, for, uh, presence in, in Italy. Uh, we, as a ministry, uh, uh, run the national system for monitoring the presence of unaccompanied minors in Italy, and this uh, phenomenon is becoming more and more important. In 2016, the number of unaccompanied minors doubled uh, from the previous year. And uh, the uh, Egyptians are largely the first nationality uh, in this case. So this is why it's important to have numbers, to produce numbers and to share them with everyone. And you will find all these numbers. That's why I stop here with the numbers, because I would like to react to other. <laughs> but I, I invite you to have a look to the uh, uh, to our portal, the Integration of Migrants portal, where you will find all these reports and the numbers on minors, for example, are published every month. And quarterly, we produce um, an analysis of the dynamics uh, at the basis of this uh, phenomenon. And then to react so to some solicitations. Uh, the challenges of lab labor migration has been said, and many of the speakers refer to the importance of having uh, legal and safe channels to enter uh, the country for uh, work reasons. And this is linked with the crisis mode, which has been mentioned as well. Uh, just to uh, share with you and explain what is the kind of reasoning behind, uh, the decision to open or to close the floor. Uh, we still have uh, a legal channel to enter the country, but it's very weakened if compared to the period before the crisis. Just to give you some numbers, in 2007, we uh, allowed for the entry into the country for work reasons to 250 and 50,000 people, 2007. This year is 30,000 today. And the number has been declining over the decade. Uh, and also the um, kind of um, permits to enter legally the country uh, are, have, have changed. Now, in this 30,000 uh, uh, allowed to enter the country this year, 17,000 are for seasonal work, and 2,000 and a half for uh, self-employment, and the rest is just conversion of other work, other permits owned for other reasons. So people already in the country, it's not a real 
quota to enter the country. It's the possibility given to people already staying in Italy for uh, work, for study, for example, or for other reasons, to convert the permit into a work permit. Um, and what is, and what is the, the problem in changing this? Uh, we have, uh, first of all, our legislation, uh, which dates back to 1998, and maybe it's time to have a look at it. But I'm not sure this is the right moment, and I'm very sure there is not the political will to uh, address this issue now. Maybe for the next legislature, it could be... Uh, the good time to start a reflection on this, uh, doesn't allow the government to go up this 30,000, so the last uh, number decided in the previous year, if the government doesn't adopt a mid-term um, planning, programming instrument on migration. So if we don't have the programming mid-term instruments, we cannot in any way go up these 30,000 entry quotas that are, have been foreseen for this year. First problem. Second problem, uh, I invite you to um, be in the place of a Ministry of Labour in this moment, in this country with a um, young unemployment rate, um, close to 40%. <coughs> and to have the political courage to say, I open up for new entries for work reason. From a political point of view, it is considered a suicide. So, uh, this has to be taken into consideration also. Um, on the blue card that was mentioned, I'm not sure it functions so well. And it's under, in Italy for sure. In Italy for sure because we have the attitude to make, in the transposition process, then to make things more and more complicated. Mm? Uh, but to my knowledge, uh, the only country where the blue card really functioned is Germany. Belgium as well. And maybe Belgium. And that's why the directive is under revision right now. But I'm not optimistic on the results of this revision, I'm sorry. Because the discussions on this uh, instrument at council level are going in the opposite direction, as always. As always. So uh, I'm quite sad, as you said, you were sad at the beginning. I'm very attached to the functioning of the European Union because uh, me too, I used to spend my last 10 years in Brussels working for the EU. But uh, we have to recognize very sadly that the principle, for example, the principle of free movement for EU citizens is under pressure right now. So uh, it's a sad moment. And reaction to a couple of other, uh, and then I, I shut up, <laughs> other things that were raised before. On the severe labor exploita exploitation, especially in agriculture, something very recently has been done by the Italian Parliament with a new law adopted in October last year and now we are all involved in um, working and drafting the national plan foreseen by the law. But for this it is important to have the cooperation of a lot of actors, in, included the social partners, who are uh, very important actors in this field and on the um, on the remark uh, made by uh, 
honorable member of the parliament, Quartabelle, that there are no uh, integration policies in our country. Integration through work. Through work, yeah. Uh, <laughs> we have a problem here, but we have to take into account the constitutional uh, organization of our country. Active labor market policies are regional competence. You know it. You try to change it. Yeah. It didn't work. <laughs> okay. In any case, uh, what does it mean? That in some areas of the country, there are very good job integration policies. In other areas of the countries, less. What can we do at national level? We can just try to coordinate try to force, force, it's a soft uh, invitation, to regions to work together and to put together differ, different funds. We have some funds, we can force the region to, uh, towards a process of integrated programming of different funds to encourage this kind of exercise this is what we are trying to do. At a national level, what can we do directly in terms of uh, job integration is to intervene with projects on specific targets, specifically vulnerable targets. And this is what we, we are doing uh, with uh, the um, refugees. And one of our interventions is mentioned and is included in the European Commission DG employment list of best practices on this. So something is going on. But uh, the only way we can follow is to work with the regions. It can be difficult, time consuming, but I see no other way to make progress. Mm -hmm.